Hello and welcome to ECE 108. So my name is Matthew Harris. A bit about myself, I graduated with a bachelor's degree in pure mathematics from the University of Evansville in Evansville, Indiana, USA. Uh, and then I attended the University of Alaska Fairbanks for a master's in pure mathematics. And finally, I came here to Waterloo and finished my PhD in applied mathematics with a specialization in fluid dynamics uh, about a year ago now. So before I get into discussing the syllabus, I briefly want to discuss the setup that we're using on LEARN. So LEARN will be our primary site for posting information and keeping you up to date. So you should be checking LEARN every day for this course. To make your life a little bit easier, I have this useful links widget. So I will be updating this useful links widget every week and it will contain pretty much all of the things that you will need for this course. So here you have the link to Crowdmark and our Piazza page that we will be using. Uh, so Piazza, pretty standard there. Uh, and then here I will have a weekly schedule, which I will discuss this in a second. My office hours are listed here with links that you can click to open up Teams. So if you clicked this button here, it would open up Teams and automatically let you join. So tutorials will start next week and I will put the appropriate links here for the tutorials shortly. And finally, you can access our syllabus and course notes here, which these are just hyperlinks to the locations in the content tab where these are located. So feel free to use this widget to make your life just that little bit easier. So let's now look at the syllabus. So again, I'm your instructor, Matthew Harris, and here I've just pasted the course description from the course catalog. Uh, I won't read this out to you, you have the ability to do that, but I will talk about the details of what we will discuss in this course once I get to our rough outline. So again, the website that we're primarily going to use is Learn with a hyperlink here. If you click any of the pink links in this document, it will open up the URL for that site. So our textbook is going to be this ECE 108 Discrete Math and Logic that was created in-house within the department of ECE. Uh, this is available on Learn via that link that I showed earlier. So for this course, we will not be using live lectures. Instead, each week I'll post a video introducing topics and going through some examples. Uh, this is actually outdated, so I will fix this, but I will actually be using YouTube this term to post my live videos, and I will show you that shortly and add a hyperlink to the YouTube channel here. In addition to these videos, you'll be assigned some readings from the text. I highly suggest that you keep up with the readings and the videos because if you start to get behind, it can be pretty difficult to catch up with some of the materials that are covered in this course. And again, each week I will have a schedule. So explicitly here, I will have a link to a weekly schedule covering the information for that week. So in terms of the content tab, that will be posted here on weekly schedules. Here in lecture slides, I will actually post the slides that I use in the videos in case you want the slides directly and your assignments will be posted here. So now getting help. So for this course, we were going, we are going to be using so for this course, we are going to be using Piazza extensively. If you have any questions, feel free to ask on Piazza. You can post any time of the day. I'll get to it as quickly as I can. And if you're a bit nervous on posting, you can post anonymously to your classmates. It won't be anonymous to me, so I can keep people from trolling, that type of thing. But I don't judge student questions. So ask any question you have. The only bad question is a question not asked. So on Piazza, you can ask questions regarding assignments, but do not post full or parcel answers to the assignments. So if you're ever questioning if something's not allowed on Piazza, you can send me a private message and I can tell you whether or not that's a appropriate question to post on Piazza. So initially, I'm going to be the only instructor monitoring Piazza, but if there are more questions than I can handle in a timely manner, I may add some of the TAs to monitor Piazza as well. So just keep that in mind. So for office hours, I have two sections of office hours. So office hours are on Tuesdays from 10.30 to 11.30 a.m. EDT and Thursdays from 8.30 to 9.30 a.m. EDT via Teams. So again, if you click these links, it'll lead you to my office hours. Or if you click these links here, that'll also open office hours. Okay, so in addition to office hours, we will have tutorials. So tutorials will be starting in week two and they will run on Tuesdays from 12.30 to 1.30 for section 41 and from 3.30 to 4.30 for section 42. So you can attend either session, but I do reserve the right to force you to attend the tutorial for your section 
if it so happens that I have 200 students going to the second session and no one going to the first session, just to keep things balanced. So for this course, there will be 11 written assignments numbered 0 through 10. These must be scanned and submitted electronically via Crowdmark, and they will be due at 9 p.m. EDT on the dates below. So explicitly, all of them are on a Friday other than this assignment 6. Assignment 6 will be moved to Wednesday, June 30th instead of the Friday due to Canada Day. And I will appropriately adjust the difficulty of assignment 6 to keep in mind that it's due a little bit earlier than normal. So late submissions will not be accepted regardless of circumstances. So assignments will normally be available at least one week before their due dates. My goal is to have them uploaded the Wednesday, the week before they're due, so you have a little bit of extra time. And all submitted solutions will be marked. So if you have a concern regarding your grade, you should bring it to me within one week of receiving the graded assignment. Grading concerns submitted to me after one week of receiving the final graded assignment will not be considered. And do keep in mind that the TAs will be marking all of your assignments. So when you send your grading concerns to me, I was not the person who marked your original assignment. Now you are encouraged to work together to solve assignment problems, but your final write-up needs to be your own. You should not look up full or partial solutions on the internet or from any printed source. The use of homework sites such as Chegg, Course Hero, Stack Exchange, etc. is strictly prohibited and I will be monitoring multiple homework help sites, so don't try to cheat. Okay, again, here's the table of when various assignments are due. Now, for this course, we will have two exams. There'll be a midterm that will be distributed Thursday, June 24th at 11 a.m. EDT, and it will be due for submission on Friday, June 25th at 11 a.m. EDT. The date of the final is still to be determined, and I will provide you with the date for the final once I have it. So for our final grade calculation, 25% comes from our written assignments. I will drop the worst written assignment. So each one of your assignments, with the exception of the worst assignment, is worth 2.5% of your grade, so take them seriously. The midterm will be worth 25% of your total grade, and the final, which will be cumulative, will be worth 50% of your final grade. If you miss a single test for a documented reason, its weight will be distributed between the written assignments pertaining to that missed test material and the remaining test. If you miss both tests for documented reasons, then you may be eligible to receive an INC grade. So the rest of this is the standard academic integrity, don't cheat, and the other standard university things that go into a syllabus. Grievance, discipline, appeals, uh, notes for students with disability, mental health information, and this information is also available on the course learn page. So if you do need it, it is there. And the university's diversity statement. So now let's look at the tentative course schedule. So I do reserve the right to divert from the schedule somewhat if needed. And keep in mind that the weekly schedule will be uploaded to learn right here. So you can see all of the information for the schedule for that week. So ECE 108 kind of naturally splits into two sections. In the first section covering weeks one through six, we introduce formal logic, how to prove mathematical statements, discuss some of the basic properties and definitions of sets, and then introduce the idea of functions as things that map elements from one set to another set. So as an engineer, this introduction to logic is directly applicable to circuits. Circuits basically speak the language of logic, and there are direct analogs between how circuits work and how logic works. Further, the proof techniques will allow you to understand how mathematics works in a deeper way. Generally speaking, in mathematics, we assume certain things are true, and then we can use logic and proof techniques to prove that given our assumptions, our proposition must hold. This is unlike many other sciences, where you gather information and use statistics to build a theory that may or may not be true, but is instead true to a certain probability. So being able to understand how mathematics works will improve your skills as an engineer, because mathematics allows you to know precisely when you can apply a theorem or when you can't apply a theorem. And also the logical deductive skills that you gain from learning how to prove simple statements can be invaluable when working on real world problems. 
Now, the next three weeks will be all about sets and various properties of sets and functions. Now, sets are the building block for many of the topics that you've seen in mathematics, such as calculus, etc. And thus, if you really want to understand mathematics at a decent level, an understanding of sets is flat out required. This is followed by week six, where we increase our knowledge of functions by introducing particular types of relations that are important for many real world applications. Now, the second half of our course is related to counting and probability. In week seven and eight, we'll talk about combinatorics, the pigeonhole principle, formalize the idea of the factorial that you should be familiar with, and introduce the concepts of permutations, combinations, and the binomial theorem. So these concepts are invaluable when working on finite dimensional problems. For instance, if I want to know the number of ways that I can pull a king out of a deck of cards, or if I wanted to know the number of possible combinations of results when I roll two dice. Finally, the last four weeks are all about introducing discrete probability and expected value. So the type of questions that we'll address in the last four weeks are what's the probability of flipping a coin 50 times and getting exactly four tails, or what is the expected return on my investment for say buying a lottery ticket. So that's roughly what we're going to cover in this course and when we're going to cover it, but do keep in mind that things might change as the term goes on. Okay, finally, the last thing to show you I mentioned that I have this schedule coming up soon. Let's examine a sample schedule to see what it looks like. Well, here is the schedule that we will have for week one, uh, minus this lecture one isn't updated yet because I'm currently making it. So what do these weekly schedules tell us? Well, here I have a table for what you should be covering on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. You can feel free to go ahead, but I do not suggest you get behind this schedule because things can be kind of difficult to catch up if you get behind. So for each lecture, I have a lecture itself and I have some lecture slides. So if I open up the lecture, it will go to the YouTube video for that lecture. And if I open up the lecture slides, it will open up the lecture slides for that lecture. So these lecture slides are just the slides that I use in the video. So if you want to look something up, you don't have to go to the video to look up all the details. But do keep in mind that in the lecture videos, I do work things out. For instance, I might work out this uh, logic table here. So you won't get everything by looking at the lecture slides themselves. In addition to the lecture slides for those particular days, I have a link to the full ECE 108 playlist. So if you open this up, it'll pop up the playlist. Here I uploaded lectures two and three. Lecture one is still being worked on, but it will be uploaded by the time you see this video for obvious reasons. Now, in addition to the video lectures and readings in the course notes, I have links to my office hours with the dates and times for my office hours, and I will have the links for the tutorials once they're done. Finally, the assignment for the week and the assignment in the next week will be listed here. So generally speaking, this link won't be clickable, but this link, if you click it, will open up to the learn page where that assignment is located at. And this assignment, for instance, is your assignment zero that is due this Friday. It's kind of a trivial assignment. You just need to answer a few questions, nothing mathematical on it, but do take it serious because it is worth two and a half percent of your grade. And I don't think you want to drop assignment zero. Now, so as you can clearly see this useful links widget can make your life quite a bit easier. Uh, I'm only highlighting it so much in this video because in previous courses, I've had students who told me they did not notice the useful links or the weekly schedule until the end of the course. So it does take a fair bit of time for me to make this and stick all the links together. So I do recommend taking advantage of it. So now finally, let's look at the anatomy of my lectures. So generally speaking, I want to try to keep these lectures on the shorter end from talking to previous students. Students generally don't like longer lectures, so I've always tried to keep mine to the shorter end. So here in the description, I'll put a table of contents where you can click these to jump to that particular part of a lecture. So say if you find yourself reading the lecture notes and wonder about implications in particular, you can just click that and jump to implications. And via the magic of YouTube, this induces chapters here. So you can jump to the chapters within this little bar to make your life a little bit easier. In addition to this, 
Uh, YouTube also has their automatic closed captions, which I will keep activating. Uh, for some reason, it seems to take a little bit of time for YouTube to generate the captions, so they might not be there for some lectures, depending on the time when I upload it and when you go to look at it, but hopefully they will be there. I'm not going to manually caption the videos, but if you do find something egregious in these subcaptions when going through the video lecture, let me know, and I can manually make modifications if that is desired. So finally, if there's any other YouTube features that anyone knows of that I could potentially look into adding, let me know. This is the first time I've been using YouTube, so I'm just now getting used to the tools. So any suggestions are more than welcome. You can send a private message or post on Piazza. So I hope you enjoy the term and feel free to voice any logistical concerns to me early on in the term so I can make modifications to make studying online that much easier for you. Okay, so let's now go on to lecture number one. Now that we've gotten the administrative stuff out of the way, let's look at some new material. So we're going to start with the definition of a proposition or a statement. So a proposition or statement is a sentence that has a definite state of either being true or false. So the best way to understand this definition is to look at a few examples. So let's do that. So the following are propositions. If x is equal to 5, then x squared minus x is greater than or equal to 0. So this is a sentence, and clearly it's either true or false. So in this example, if I were to plug 5 into this statement here, I would get 5 squared minus 5, which is 20, is greater than 0. That is true, so this would be a true statement. So for our next example, the square root of 2 is rational. So this is a well-known fact that the square root of 2 is not rational. It's in fact irrational. We will prove that next week. So in this case, this will be a false statement. Again, it's a statement because I can determine whether or not it's true or false. Next, cats are mammals. Well, cats either are mammals or aren't mammals. And in this case, cats are mammals, so this would be a true statement. So if these are examples of propositions, what's an example of a non-proposition? Well, x squared minus x is greater than or equal to zero. In this case, I don't know what x is. So this sentence could be true if x is, say, 5, but I need to know what x is in order to ascertain whether this is true or false. Therefore, this is not a proposition. But instead, it's what we would call an open sentence. If I specify some restrictions to x, I could turn this into a proposition. So second, m minus 7 divided by 2m plus 4 is equal to 5. Well, I don't know what m is, so I don't know whether or not this is true or false or even well-defined, right? If m is negative 2, I would divide by 0. So in this case, this would also be an open sentence because I could make it a proposition if I specified a restriction on m. Thirdly, let x be a natural number. So in this case, this isn't a statement. It's neither true or false. Uh, I'm just defining what x is an element of. So this is not a proposition, nor is it an open sentence. Open sentences denoted by capital P of x can become statements if we assigned a value to the variable. So in this course, we're not going to work much with open sentences, but they are common examples of non-propositions that can be made into a proposition if I assign a value to one or more variables. Okay, so a truth table. A truth table is a systematic and simple way to list all the possible truth values of a statement. So if I have a statement, it could be true or false, depending on the values of one or more variables within the statement. And a truth table allows me to build a systematic way of listing all of these possible truth values. So let's look at an example. Let P be the statement you were rickrolled yesterday, and let Q be the statement you had a nice day yesterday. So with these two statements, I can build what's called a compound statement, say R, and I can let this be the statement you got rickrolled yesterday and you had a nice day yesterday. So now I can ask the question, what are the possible values of P, Q, and R? So the systematic way to do this is a truth table. So let's do this. If we were to break down R, we can notice that R is simply the same thing as saying P and Q. We got Rick rolled yesterday and we had a nice day yesterday. So now if I were to build the truth table of all the possible values of P, Q, and R, how would I do this? Well, I'd first write a table with P, Q, and R at the top index. And now I need to go through all the possible 
possible values of p and q and use them to determine all the possible values of r. So since both p and q can both be either true or false, I will have 2 squared. So the 2 part is coming from the option of true and false, and the squared part is coming from the fact that I have two values, p and q. But I will have 2 squared entries in this table to represent all the possible values of p and q. So first I can say what if p is true and q is also true. So if I was Rickrolled yesterday and I had a nice day yesterday, if both of these are true, then obviously I got Rickrolled yesterday and had a nice day yesterday. So if p is true, q is true, then r would be true. Next, we could say have p be true, have q be false, and then what would r be? Well, if p is true and q is false, that means I was Rickrolled yesterday, but I did not have a nice day. Therefore, the statement you got Rickrolled yesterday and had a nice day yesterday would be false. So at this point, we have gone through all of the possibilities of P being true. Now let's look at the possibilities of P being false. Well, if P is false, then either Q is true or false. And in both cases, since I was not Rickrolled yesterday, then the statement you got Rickrolled yesterday and had a nice day yesterday would be false. So the next true entries will be false, true, false and false, false, true. So here you can see this table contains all the possible combinations of truth values of P and Q, and therefore contains all the possible values for R. So in the next lecture, we'll further get into the details of this AND operation. But for now, this is the basic idea of a truth table. It's just a systematic way of writing the various truth values. So now, one more definition. Uh, in the above, P and Q are called statement variables of the truth table, and we refer to P and Q as statement variables because the truth value of R is dependent on the truth values of P and Q. So in some sense, they are the variables of the compound statement. So now let's examine some logical connectives. So first we're going to define parenthesization. So parenthesization is the use of parentheses to force precedence in order to make a statement unambiguous. So for an example, recall how PEDMOS is used to make the order of operations in standard arithmetic unambiguous. Well, in formal logic, parentheses serve the same type of purpose. So let's look at the truth table for the parentheses operator applied to some proposition P. So any given proposition P can either be true or false. Well, if P is true, then parentheses P will also be true. And further, if P is false, then parentheses P will also be false. Thus, our use of parentheses does not change the truth value of a statement. It just allows us to get rid of the ambiguity that could exist for compound statements. So now let's look at negation. So the negation of a statement P, denoted by this not P, is the statement asserting the opposite truth to P. So that's to say not P is false when P is true, and not P is true when P is false. So let's give a couple examples of how to negate statements. So the negation of the statement, if x is equal to 5, then x squared minus x is greater than is equal to 0, what do you think that would be? So pause the video for a second and think of how you would possibly negate this statement. OK, so the negation of this would be if x is equal to 5, then x squared minus x is less than 0. So let's go through another example. What is the negation of the square root of 2 is rational? So again, pause the video and think of what you believe the negation would be. So here, the negation of this statement will simply be that the square root of 2 is not rational or the square root of 2 is irrational, assuming we're working within the reals. So finally, the statement cats are not mammals, what would the negation of this be? Well, simply cats are not mammals. Okay, so finally, the truth table for the negation operator will simply be this truth table here. So if P is true, not P is false, and if P is false, not P is true. So now for this lecture, make sure you read pages 5 through 11 in the text. And if you want to, you can read the logical uh, connectives on page 12 and 13. In our next lecture, we will continue with our discussion of logical connectives by introducing some more logical operators, and then we will demonstrate how you can prove statements via a logical table.